But kia ora and welcome. And as Ryan said, well done on making it out of bed. That's a massive achievement. I want to just sort of jump back three years ago. So what that looked like for me was I was working at Te Papa, working on designing both events and exhibitions. So I started out as an intern at Te Papa when I was at Massey University. And then I saw the opportunity for an experience design role to be created. So it made sense to me that a museum had someone who advocated for working with communities and advocated for design thinking to be brought into the design of both their events and exhibitions. So they did establish a, a, an experience design role. I applied for the job and then I managed to land it against the other applicants. I was stoked because it was my dream job and I'd created it. The experience design role was very much the first of its kind naturally at Te Papa and during my time there a second experience design role was established and I worked alongside Chloe Johnston um, to basically champion for community engagement so that meant running workshops with the community, sharing our plans for exhibitions and events um, and then also running workshops with staff to involve them in the design thinking process. So here you can see this is one of the exhibitions I worked on, which was called Bug Lab. So I worked on it in collaboration with Weta Workshop. Uh, I got to work with uh, Richard Taylor. That was an incredible experience. And there was, um, these are some more shots of the bug lab experience. We had a bit of fun as well. Um, and then the other sort of flip side to it was working on the event. So to Papa Talks was a real highlight for me because it was the first time the museum had co-designed an event before. So we got people along to workshops. We said, hey, look, we're going to do this animation event what would you like it to be like they suggested to us the speakers they suggested the format right down to what was in the goodie bags and then we also got to you know look at creating the design for it so leaning on our graphic design skills to bring some of the event collateral to life during my time there i also got to work on the new toy art gallery um, and so there was a range of events and experiences I was lucky enough to work on with an incredibly, uh, there was heaps of creative people working on these projects. But five years into working at Te Papa, um, something happened that totally changed the course of my life path. Um, a close friend of ours committed suicide. Um, and in the same month, my nana, who I was incredibly close with, passed away. And when she passed, she left me a letter. And this is what she told me. My dearest Celeste, my life has gone by so quickly. Life is precious. Celeste, don't aim for success. Just do what you love and success will follow. Love, nana. It's wonderful advice, right? To me, it was a reminder. It was a wake up call that shook me out of my day to day routine. Sometimes it just takes someone you love to pass away to reflect on just how precious life is and to remind you that we can't take tomorrow for granted. It was these two deaths that made me reevaluate what was important to me and my priorities. So this is me, looking quite confident on the outside, facilitating workshops at Te Papa. But on the inside, I was reevaluating things and my life. I realised I wanted to escape the traditional ways of working, but was wondering how. Whilst facilitating these workshops at work, I began to wonder, how might I apply some of these, these tools that I use every day to radically redesign my own life? Ever curious, I wondered, I, I wondered how could this actually work if I started to, to apply them to not only me, my life, but also tried them on my husband, Glenn. 
And so the experiment began. But before I started getting into the design tools and the exercises, like setting up any sort of space for an agile sprint or a workshop, um, I felt like I too needed a creative space for this work to happen. I mean, as creatives, you guys will all know just how important it is to have a space, a creative space that facilitates um, this sort of thinking to have happen. I mean, go there's a reason why places like Google and that invest so much time and energy into creating innovative workspaces. So before getting started, I began to ponder though, what did a creative workspace actually look like to me? So I went over the usual spaces that promote creativity for me and I started to think, you know, oh, I might need a whiteboard or maybe it's in one of the breakout spaces. I need to do some research on the computer, blog, sketching, have a shower, go for a walk. And the more I thought about <clears throat> all of those different things, the more none of those actually made sense to me. And actually what I realized I craved was that I wanted to work in nature um, or from anywhere for that matter. And so into nature I went. I grabbed a notebook, a blanket, some post-it notes and off I went. And I sat there for hours working through the different design tools I use for clients, but this time on myself and started to design a different experience for our life. This is not something that just happened over a weekend. I probably spent about six months on and off doing this design process, shifting between the beach or my spot in the bush. And I had heaps of conversations along the way um, with a lot of my best friends through tears, laughter, talked to people who were freelancers, people who ran their own businesses. And I ran them through some of the ideas I was thinking, got their feedback and input, kind of what you naturally do as a designer when you're working on a design and you need some feedback. And I guess through this process, it was really highlighting that as designers, co-design and human-centered design is about looking at designing for people. And so I was, it's about taking someone's current state, their current experience, and looking to create a desired or future state. And somewhere in the middle, we create, we innovate in order to transform them from that current state to the desired one. So a more common sort of way of thinking about it is you might have, you might be designing wayfinding and the current state is that they're feeling lost and confused in the space. And the desired state that we're looking to shift them to is one which is they feel guided and confident and they know where they're going. And that part in the middle is our way finding our innovation. So you can do this for yourself, right? And so I started to think, what was the change in state that I desired? How was I currently feeling and how would I like to feel? And in the simplest way possible, how might I create design or improve my existing experience that part in the middle in order to get there. Another part of that was also looking at journey maps. So I was looking at my day, my week and my month and I was mapping it out as a journey map. Um, and figuring out what were some of the pain points in my day. If you're not familiar with journey maps, you might want to think of it as a, a more common term, a burden basket. So what was in my burden basket? What were all of the things that were quite frustrating or pains? And what could I look at taking out of my burden basket in order to lighten the load and bring more joy and stuff that I did enjoy into my days? So one of the things you can see what, that I started to identify was a pain point for me was my commute. And I was living in Pukarua Bay, which is about 45 minutes out of Wellington. And that meant in order to get to, to Papa every day, I was spending about an hour and a half each way. And on a bad day, it could take up to two, two and a half hours each way to get to work. 
And so I sat down and I started to do a little bit of the, the maths and I looked, okay, that's three hours a day. That's 15 hours per week. That's 780 hours a year. And over the span of my 45 year career, that's 35,100 hours. So in more sort of like a way that you can actually digest that, that's 1,462 days just sitting in the car. I was like, what a waste of life. That is just such a waste. Well, imagine what else I could be doing with that 1,462 days. Um, so a great way to look at your pain and be like, how might I do that differently? So for me, that looked like remote work, working from home and shifting that and flipping it on its head a little bit. I guess through doing some of this work, it's really about taking the time to think about what's important to you and reconnecting with your passions. We get so busy in life, especially these days. Our schedules are so full that, you know, by the time we do family stuff, work, adulting, I don't know about you, but you're so exhausted from the week that there's not really much left over for energy, for, your, you, for yourself, let alone much else. So this is really about prioritizing some time for you. So if you do seek change, you can actually design what that change looks like for yourself. And some of the questions I asked myself as part of this as well was, what did a good day at work look like in the future? It was really also questioning what brings me joy and how can I do more of that? So I looked at my sort of journey map, my burden basket, and then I was like, okay, what brings me joy? What can I, how can I bring more of that joy into my day? And also another question I found useful was what did I want to do when I was 12 years old and am I living out that passion? For me, I did actually want to be a designer, so I knew that I, I was living out my passion. I just needed to tweak some of my parts of my day to make that journey even better. I think that's a really powerful question to ask yourself though, because often when we're young, we have aspirations in line with our passions. But as we get older, we get pushed into careers that bring, bring about stability, um, but are not necessarily, you know, bringing about happiness or joy so this experiment and using the different design tools then sparked a series of radical events it started by saying goodbye to our nine to five jobs our consistency our safety which comes with a stable job and income and this moment was com combined with feelings of fear of leaving, financial worry, as well as the fears of the unknown. And it's safe to say quitting our job was terrifying. It feels like you're standing at the top of a bungee, you're afraid of heights, and you're being asked to jump without any rope security. It's bloody hard to build yourself up to jump. Um, the nerves were also heightened by the fact that we just recently brought a section so we had responsibilities like paying a mortgage and Glenn my husband had quit his job first so my brain was telling me you need to stay in your job provide sense of security for your family you know um, it's safe to say change is really scary and it takes a lot of courage to back yourself and jump but for me, I knew it was the right thing to do. And through doing these different design tools and activities and all of those conversations, I now had a plan. And part of that plan was naturally being jobless, money was tight, and so we needed to reduce our outgoings. That meant mo moving out of our flat up onto the section, which you can see here. Uh, we borrowed a caravan off, off our friends, which you see, it was quite retro and styly. Um, and we lived in that over the course of nine months through winter. Now, the idea of a caravan sounds great, 
but leaks, showers outside, dirt in the bed are realities that I'm sure people never really actually tell you about. So I'm telling you, if this is something you're considering about, remember that, dirt in the bed, not, not so good. And showers outside in winter, not ideal either. I feel like the idea of it is better than the reality of it. Personally, I wouldn't want to do it again, but it does make for a good story and some laughs. So living out of the caravan, a workspace in the bush became the next priority. We started to wonder, why couldn't we build a successful design studio and business in the middle of the forest? As you can tell, for me, nature is what fuels my creativity. So building Studio C in the middle of the bush and doubling down on nature was essential. We'd never, but we'd never built anything before. So I did some sketches and then Glenn set to work and over the course of a mere four weeks, we built Studio C with our own two hands and some extra help of our friends and family. Like you can see there, having a go on the digger. I wasn't the best at the digger, just, uh, yeah, no career as a digger driver. Um, this is the window just next to me here being framed up. And as you can see, our creative design studio is now surrounded by trees, birds, wildlife, and not much else. Our studio is on the same site as where we live, so cropped out of this image um, as you walk through the bush is where our future house will be. Um, and so now you can sort of see, gone are the long commutes and it's just a short walk through the bush to work every morning. As you can see, it's just a small box in the bush and that was exactly how we intended it to be. So the Studio C headquarters is just 10 square meters. That's the average size of your bedroom. And for us, it really proves that you don't need a massive space or an office to be creative or run a successful design studio from. So Studio C is technically uh, just the three of us. So uh, you'll see Glenn there, who's my husband. He is a design engineer, so engineer by trade. We've got our cute, adorable puppy. He's not really a puppy anymore because he's about two years old, but he's our stick consultant, a job he takes very seriously. Um, so between the three of us, we're quite a good mix and um, we find the balance between engineering and designer a really quite good mix in terms of advocating for people and aesthetic as well as making sure it's functional. So we do this work alongside um, alongside what we call our collectives, a group of freelance creatives, some of which are captured here. Each are all masters in their fields and they dip in and out of projects alongside us as and when needed. Our work is really focused on intentional work, so we help organisations connect with the people they exist to serve. So we offer a full range of visual communication design services and it's always backed by our co-design strategy. So that means depending on where we are in the design process, you'll either find us out in the community, uh, collaborating with our clients and understanding what it is the people we're designing for really need and desire, um, or you might find us working remotely from our homes or in the studio here. I also wanna be really frank in that Sure, I don't spend three hours a day in a car anymore, but as a business owner, I'm actually busier now more than ever and way more than I was in my old job. But there's a difference. That's my choice as opposed to being the necessity. And I really wanna be honest, running your own business is the most challenging thing I've ever done. And it comes with a plethora of challenges. Some help you grow and while well, some are just challenges. But I think that's why it's so important to be doing your passion so that when it does get tough, you know, you can, you can dig deep because you are doing what it is you love. 
One of the other challenging things at the moment throughout this whole course too is, as you can see here, we're in the process of building our own house whilst uh, also building a business. Um, so Glenn is taking on this challenge himself, again, building it with his own two hands. We don't have a team of builders. Uh, so he's taking a bit more of a backseat on Studio C stuff in the short term while he focuses on that. As you can see, we're trying to live our life to the full. I love my work environment and I really, really love helping others also think, think outside the box, maximize their opportunities for change and build a business in life they love too. If you are feeling a little craving for change, I think summer and the summer breaks are really good time to be doing some of this work because you actually have the headspace for it. So I thought I'd do a little bit of a recap. So at some point we all come face to face with change, you know, whether it's someone passing away, whether it's something like COVID that makes us realize, okay, you know, I actually do need a bit of a change in my life at the moment. And so if you do come face to face with change, it's about hacking, you're a designer, you're a creative, everyone is a creative at heart. How can you hack the tools you use on a daily basis and apply them to your life to create something different, to create that change? It's really about carving out time for yourself though and prioritizing yourself and finding a creative place, whatever that might look like for you to do that. Think about what is the sort of current and future state. So how are you feeling and how would you like to feel? And then um, look at potentially your pain points. So journey map or do a little burden basket and ideate and map out opportunities for what that change might look like. Side note, every workplace should have a dog. So if you're reimagining a reality for yourself, definitely put a dog into it. Also, own what works for you as a creative. I'm sure there was heaps of people at Tapapa when I was quitting that thought I was probably having a quarter life crisis because I was leaving my stable job to go live in a caravan. But, you know, I really owned what felt right for me. And so just trust yourself and do whatever creative path feels right for you. And I want to leave you with some advice for, from, from my nan. And so life is very precious. Time is the most valuable thing in the world and life goes by so quickly. It's important to spend this precious time in life doing what it is we love. So I want you to think about that and ponder, what does that look like for you? Kia ora. Oh, if we had an in-person audience, I think everyone would be up clapping right now. That was one of the most amazing talks. Thank you, Celeste. Oh, thanks. We've also got a bunch of fabulous questions and a lot of great support from people in the um, chat. So thank you for all the comments and stuff that people have left. Uh, everyone absolutely loved your work, uh, your studio. And I think leaving that slide up is probably the perfect place to leave it. <laughs> um, but we've got a few questions that I'd love to go through. So... We've got one here, so I'm just getting up a little bit. Um, basically, the, there was a question on key highlights from Spike, um, but I think what she was talking about was perhaps right at your um, early days with Papa that highlights some memory moments that you really reflect on that really have shaped your way forward. Um, I think a huge highlight and part of a shaping the work that I do now is just the sheer amount of diversity and workshops that I got to run. So, you know, it might be that I would be one day running a workshop with Weta and our internal design teams and curators. And then another day you would be working with teams from the, the public. And then another day you might be running a workshop with Iwi that is in, you know, is led by, uh, you know, iwi and you've had to translate your activities into Tadeo. So like a huge amount of diversity as well as the challenge, a uh, cool thing was the challenge of figuring out how co-design processes could be injected into the exhibition design process. 
Um, another one was the diversity of the team. So often when you're designing an exhibition, you'll have writers, illustrators, designers, installers, like all of these experts in their field. And it was really cool to work with so many masters of their fields um, and to not have the pressure to have to come up with the writing or the content because you had someone on the team who was dedicated as a writer to doing that. Awesome. Um, that's amazing. We have another question on that and you had, a, you had a lot of great um, analogies and word choices that I think we could almost get a recap of to share around. But one of them was around your burden basket and it was a fantastic way of putting it. Someone has asked, um, what other things would you perhaps find in your burden basket if you don't mind sharing? Um, so in terms of my burden basket, I think one of them was around sort of flexibility in my day. So I wanted to be able to not have to feel like I needed to work from nine till five. And yeah, so that word flexible was really important. I mean, as a creative, I, it's just not practical for me to be sitting at my desk nine till five. It's not how my creative brain works. And so it might be that I'm feeling creative at 10 PM at night and I don't want, I didn't want to have to feel pressured to be creative at a certain hour. So that was one sort of burden thing that I wanted to take out. Um, there were other things like we looked at Glenn's burden basket as well. So he was racing motorcycles at the time, something that previously brought him joy. And he was like, actually, I've got the reality is it's no longer bringing me joy. I need to take that out. And he was also doing a university course to upskill himself. And he's like, I'm, I'm almost through the course. I should pretty much continue. But he's like, it's really not bringing me any joy. So we were like, right, take it out. Um, so those are kind of examples of, of that. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, we have another question here, moving a bit more on to how uh, Studio C operates a little bit. And one from Ryan uh, Sorry, I can't see his last name. Ryan Crayson. Um, great first name, by the way. Uh, did you find already that you had a captive client base before venturing out on your own? Or were you uh, thrown to hustling and finding the clients in the void of having a stable job? Um, so at the time, I was juggling working full time at Te Papa and trying to build up a freelance base. So what that looked like is working probably from about sort of four to 5 a.m. before work on client work, then going to Te Papa, doing work at Te Papa. And then when I got home from Te Papa, doing creative freelance work in order to try build that base and then make the jump. Um, yeah, so there was a quite an intense period for a while of trying to build that base. Cool. Um, I'll jump to a, an off question from that. I bet there's quite a few questions in the same regard. But um, if you could, this is from Ashley Kennedy. If you could, would you have more than one dog in or part of your whanau slash studio? <laughs> Yes, we'll definitely get another dog at some point, for sure. Just not sure what. I mean, it'll have to keep up with Ollie, border collie, full of energy. So, yeah, but definitely. Would Ollie perhaps become stick manager instead of stick manager? <laughs> I don't know. We'd have to discuss that in the role change. Sounds like a very important conversation to have. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, moving on. Um, We've got a fabulous question from Pippa. Um, she says, such a good talk, Celeste. What would be your top tip from working from such a remote location? Um, top tip. I think that there's a couple. So having really good internet is important because obviously you're doing a lot of work remote, Zoom, uh, downloading files off Google Drive, uploading. I think that in-person catch-ups are really important. So we have a little sort of freelance coffee, coffee dates where you can kind of go and share any frustrations which you might have, but also socially connect with one another. Um, so building in those social interactions is important. 
especially when you're a chatterbox like me. Um, what else? Um, oh, and trying to create a little bit of routine for yourself. So because your, your structure is more flexible than nine till five, it's kind of setting yourself up with a little bit of a routine and a place of work to go to or a time and times where you are sort of most creative. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. No, that was great. It actually answered another question from Rebecca about how you not, uh, how can you stay connected and not feel isolated being out in the bush? Um, yeah, I get, I, I get asked that one all the time. So people are like, oh, how does it work in terms of you're so far out into the bush and, you know, while there's Zoom in terms of technology helps and facilitates a lot of that work. But the huge part of what we do is actually going down and out into the community. So you'll often find us down working with the clients out on the streets, running workshops. Uh, so we do have those sort of two branches and that builds that sort of connection and community sort of community time with community. Oh, fantastic. Um, we've also got a question here from Maria um, who says, does nature also take a part in the client slash projects you seek to work with? Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. And it also attracts the sort of clients that we want to work with as well. Um, you know, because we're a little bit different, it does naturally like, but it kind of, you know, attracts those sorts of people too. Cool. Um, we've got a question from Liz, who says, thanks for sharing your story, Celeste. Wondering if you've found slash sourced um, or how you've found slash sourced the talented freelance creatives that make up your cooperative team. <laughs> um, so some of them I've worked with in the past. Um, so, you know, like Pip and I and Zoe all worked together at Te Papa. Um, and so we already had those pre, pre-established working relationships. We knew what we were um, how we'd work with one another um, and our skill sets. Uh, in other ways, it's been on Instagram through Massey University. I do a lot of tutoring there. So I kind of get to see the different graduates coming through um, and have coffees with them, kind of get to know them. Um, so it just has kind of happened quite organically. Um, yeah, and then in the past, I've, you know, Christine, I also went to uni with, so, you know, it's a mix of fresh and existing relationships. Oh, that's really cool. Um, if there's any more burning questions, feel free to chuck in the chat. We actually just got one, as I said, look at that. Um, please chuck in a few more. We've got a little bit more time. Um, one from Thomas here. Thanks for the inspiration. I have another question about working in a cooperative. What are the tools and workflows you use to collaborate? And how do you manage your availability and scheduling? Um, so that's definitely something we're working on in terms of like, I wouldn't say we've cracked that in any way. Um, but, you know, we do use tools like um, Monday in terms of helping schedule um, different projects and allowing our clients to jump in and see that sort of scheduling and where we're at. Um, Trello, we're on quite a few different Trello boards. I'm probably saying the ones that you all probably already know. Um, as well as, um, you know, Harvest for time tracking, all of those sorts of things um, uh, around and, and, you know, we're using. Cool. Uh, we've got a question here from Sahar. She says, so inspiring. Thanks, Celeste. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned in the process of radicalizing your life? Uh, biggest lessons? Tough question. I think one of them is that if you're going to, you know, do something and create that change for yourself, it really, I just cannot emphasize enough you know, really dig deep on your passion so that when you have those moments of challenges, you know, you've got the passion sort of carrying you through that. Um, uh, biggest challenges. I 
Um, I actually think one of them too is it's different running your own business. Uh, a lot of the pressure falls on you as an individual, as opposed to you know someone at Te Papa. Um, you know, so there's a there's quite a lot of pressure riding on you to make sure that you not only wearing your business owner hat like finances making sure they're all okay and then creative side of things making sure that your creative delivery is all okay too so um yeah i think that's a challenge is juggling quite a lot of projects and wearing a lot of different hats um yeah and having to flex all of those muscles throughout the day and over the course of the week um but i think like i said in my presentation it's so different when you're doing it for yourself you know it's just a totally different thing like i'm choosing to do that um so when stuff does get difficult i'm like well that's my choice and i'm working towards my dream and my goals and my passion so it's really worthwhile <laughs>